friends. Thank you so much for joining me again for another Zion Nights online uh, lesson, if you would. In fact, tonight is our last lesson for this spring semester of our Zion Nights. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time, uh, making the effort to join me over these past few uh, Wednesday nights here, these past few weeks. Um, of course, we are still planning on having our fall semester of Zion Nights, but Lord willing, the way things are looking, we are going to be able to do that in person. Our fall semester usually runs October through November. We usually finish up right before Thanksgiving, so hopefully you guys will join us then. But I am uh, grateful that you've taken the time to join us in this very unusual platform online in this very unusual season, but uh, I am looking forward to things moving up and, and becoming a little bit more uh, what we would call uh, normal. So as we close this series of our Zion Nights together uh, tonight, I'd like to take a moment just to pray, and then uh, we're going to take a, a few minutes tonight just to look at uh, probably one of the most famous parable, uh, parables uh, of Jesus. And so uh, with that uh, in mind, let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Father, we want to just uh, take a moment even now just to invite your presence to be with us. I'm asking uh, that the preacher would come, the teacher would come, that Lord, you would help me to be true to your word, to, to articulate it well. Uh, that we would be able to understand what is happening in the scripture and that really give some thought to our own hearts and lives uh, tonight to, to see where we're at in, in regards to these things. So, Lord, I, I thank you for all of those that have made the effort to tune in on these Wednesday nights. I pray that these studies have been a blessing to them. If anything, just getting them to, to spend some time in your word, what a blessing that is. And so, uh, Lord, uh, just just bless this uh, this evening that we have together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, as you guys know, we're studying the life of Christ here in this uh, spring uh, Zionite uh, semester. We've reached the point in Jesus's life that I've called the uh, the point of a controversy over the the person of of Jesus Christ. People are. Who is this guy, right? Who, who is he really? Well, what's going on there? And there's a lot of questions that are are growing, a lot of controversy that is, is happening. And if you'll uh, remember last week, we kind of talked this idea of Jesus presenting himself to Israel, to the nation of Israel, to the people as the Christ the Messiah, uh, Messiah presenting himself and the kingdom, but we're going to see that the, the masses are going to be led by the Pharisees, the religious leaders, um, in the rejection of Christ. The Pharisees, they've already done it. We looked at that last week in, in uh, Matthew chapter 12, and uh, they were just outright Jesus is in union with Satan. We are rejecting him. He is not the Christ. He is not the Messiah. As a matter of fact, it's not going to be too long. They're going to begin plotting to kill Jesus. And so we see those seeds beginning. Now, I understand that not everybody is rejecting Jesus at this point. There are still people that will believe. There are still people that will uh, come to faith in Christ. There's a bunch of different responses that are happening. Some people are getting excited, and then they hear something, and maybe they didn't like like what Jesus said, maybe this is harder, maybe it's not what I thought it was, and, and they turn away. That's one of the things you see as you study the life of Christ. He grows these crowds, and then eventually it comes down to just him, right? Just him, because even his disciples will disperse in that garden of Gethsemane. But with that being said, for the most part, the Pharisees, they have rejected Christ. Uh, you can make a case for somebody like Nicodemus, maybe some of the others, but as a whole, they have rejected and they're going to begin plotting against Christ. As a result, things begin to change in the ministry of, of Jesus. One of the things that I said last week is you see him uh, no longer focusing on just the nation of, of Israel when it comes to the presentation of the kingdom, but he begins to present it even to the Gentiles. 
thousand. Amen for that, right? That's you and I. We're here today because of that. But another thing we see and we start to notice in the ministry of Jesus, he begins to teach and preach in parables, almost exclusively in parables. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 13, please. Matthew chapter 13. And uh, we're going to look at the famous uh, parable of the sower or the sower and the seed. And we're going to look and see what Jesus has to say about these parables. And the disciples are going to ask him, why are you even teaching in these parables? And so we're going to take a look at that. And I know it might be a little bit redundant, but hey, this is supposed to be a Bible study. This is about you and I reading the word of God, thinking through it. So we're also going to look at the other account in Mark chapter 4. In Luke chapter 8, we're just going to read through all three of them, and then we're going to kind of process it. So this is Matthew 13, then we'll look at Mark chapter 4, and Luke chapter 8, all right? Now before that, I think it's important that uh, we look, uh, because we're going to see why Jesus spoke in parables, we're going to kind of wrestle through that, and then we're going to specifically look at this parable of the sower, we're going to look at his um, definition of it, or he's going to explain it to the disciples, and then we're going to try to make application to our life today. But before that, I, I think it's important we understand what a parable is. Now, in the Greek, we get that word parable, and it's really kind of just a transliteration. That's where they take the Greek word, and they just kind of make the spelling look like English. In the Greek word, it's a compound word, para, and I think it's Balas. Uh, it might be, I don't know if my pronunciation is just right, but para is, is a preposition, right? It means like to, to come alongside, uh, along. Um, and then the balas is kind of where we get the word ball. The idea is to throw. So it's the idea of to throw alongside of. Um, a parable is something that comes alongside. It's a, a story. Um, some people call them as illustrations. Uh, they are come alongside, and the idea is that they are not the truth, but they come alongside to, to in, a, in a tense and purpose, to uh, reveal the truth, to reveal the truth. Some people think of parables, um, stories, that's a, a good way to, to think of it, that um, something is hidden and maybe you're trying to reveal. Uh, Jesus used these parables, uh, I like to think of them as, as riddles, and we'll get to that in just a minute, but that's what a parable is. Uh, in fact, some of my, uh, back in my Bible school days, they would refer to um, um Parables as an earthly story with a, a heavenly meaning or revelation. That might even be a better definition for us to use. So thank you, Lord, for, for that one. Help me to remember that one. All right. So we understand kind of what a parable is. If not, I'm sorry for failing on that. <laughs> you, you can look it up and find some very helpful definitions to, to get you to think through that. I always think of them as riddles. All right. Matthew chapter 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. That same day, it might be nice to have a point of reference here in Matthew 12. You'll remember even in our opening remarks, we talked about the Pharisees. Jesus has been healing people. He cast out a demon. Uh, and the Pharisees are like, yeah, he's able to do that because he's like Satan himself. He's in line with Satan. Jesus talks about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's not going to be forgiven. Not only that, just prior and after his mom, his, his brothers and sisters, they're, they're coming to find him. They, they, they think he's out of his mind. They think he's doing way too much. And they're like, he's going crazy. So after all this happens... Right, they, the crowd finally presses and they're like, hey, Jesus, your mom, your brother, your sisters, they're outside. They're worried about you. They're freaking out. And Jesus, uh, he says, who's my mother? Who's my brother? Who's my sister? He said, it's the one who does the will of God. Now, it's after this, that same day, he leaves the house and he goes and he sits beside the sea. And it says that great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and he sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables. And here it is, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. The birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, 
since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then he says this as he kind of finishes up this uh, very odd story of a sower and seed in the middle of his sermon and talking to the crowds. Right here they are to hear him teach and preach, and he's talking about farming lessons. He says this, he who has ears, let him hear. Then the disciples come to him. And they said to him, Jesus, why are you speaking in these riddles, in these, these parables, right? I think it's important for us to understand or notice that even right away with the disciples, this idea of the parables is they're having trouble understanding exactly what Jesus is trying to get across. I think, I think that's important for us to recognize here, even at the beginning. And so he said to them, good news, right? To you it has been given or granted to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So right away he's making a distinction between the disciples, uh, those that are there. Of course, this would be the 12 and, and some of those others, as opposed to them out there uh, that has not been given to them. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Now remember our immediate context, right? He, I believe in this, this specific statement here, he is first and foremost on his mind are those religious leaders. People that should know better, and here they are accusing the power of God, God in the flesh, as being in union with Satan, doing these miracles and these things. They just have an outright uh, rejection of Christ. And these are people that should see, right? These are people that, that should know. These are like the religious leaders of the day. They're the, the pastors and the teachers, and they are just turning a blind eye to Jesus, openly rejecting him. And he says, oh, I'm talking in these riddles because seeing they don't see, and hearing they don't hear, they don't understand. Look at what he says here. He quotes Isaiah. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. It says, you will indeed hear, but you'll never understand. You will indeed see, but you will never perceive. Right? That's not just the religious Pharisees, but that's as that continues to grow to the masses of people that are hardening their hearts and rejecting Jesus. His person is the Messiah and his message and his kingdom, his, his gospel. He continues in Isaiah, and he says, For this people's heart has grown dull. You might remember that word in our study of, of Hebrews uh, chapter 5 and chapter 6. Dull, they, they are sluggish. They are, they are lazy. They, they, don't, they don't care anymore, right? They have eyes. They have ears. They see. They're hearing. They're watching Jesus do these things. They're hearing these things, but they don't care. They, they have no interest in understanding what Jesus has said. All they can think of is how can we get him? How can we get him? How can we get him? They've rejected. There's that hardness there. And with their ears, they can barely hear their eyes. They've closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they do hear, talking to the disciples. Now let's look at the same passage in Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Again he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teachings, he said to them, listen, listen up, behold, a sower. Here's the story. We all know it, right? So let's kind of, we'll, we'll kind of, I'll try to read through this a little quicker with a little less commentary. He went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, the birds, they came and devoured the seed. And then he said, other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth 
of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no grain. But other seed did fall into good soil, and it did produce grain, growing up, increasing, yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and even a hundredfold, right? And then he said, here it is again, right? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now here, Mark gives us a little bit of detail that Matthew didn't. It says, when he was alone, those around him with the twelve, right, his disciples plus the twelve, begin to ask him about these parables. Now what I think is interesting is that even here, they didn't fully understand what exactly Jesus is, why, what are you telling us about this story of, of farming, like, do we need to go buy seeds? Could you imagine being in that crowd? Here you are seeing this man doing incredible stuff. You, I mean, he's preaching with power and authority. Now all of a sudden he's he's talking in riddles, right? And he says, hey, the a, a sower went to sow seed. And everybody's like, yeah, that's kind of happens all the time. We, we live in an agrarian society. Like people farm. Yeah, we plant seeds. And, and then Jesus gives no follow through. Just kind of leaves the riddle, leaves it hanging, and no follow through. And we see that the disciples, when they're alone, they begin to ask Jesus about the parables. And, hey, Jesus, why are you teaching in the, these parables and these riddles? And he says, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. Remember that distinction we had talked about earlier. There's a distinction. So that... Once again, he's quoting that Isaiah passage. They may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Luke. Luke records this for us as well in Luke chapter 8. And he says, When a great crowd was gathering, and people from town to I'm sorry, people from town after town came to him. So he said in a parable. Here it is again. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. The birds of the air devour it. Some fell on, on the rock, and as it grew, it withered away because it had no moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up uh, with it and, and choked it. Some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, remember Mark said that they were alone here and in Matthew, they're wanting to understand what well, Jesus, what are you trying to teach us? What are, what are you saying? So they ask him for the meaning and Jesus is going to give it to them. It says to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others, they are in parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. All right. Those are our passages. Now let's let's uh, think through this real quick. Pardon me. For me, one of the things that jumps out right away is that in, in all three accounts, Jesus' answer to the disciples on the parables and why he's teaching in parables, it's the same. And if you think about it, it's actually a little bit surprising. You would think that Jesus would say that he's teaching in these, these parables so that people would understand or, or understand better, but he doesn't. In fact, he says just the opposite, doesn't it? He, he says it's so that people will see but not perceive. They will hear but not understanding, referencing in Isaiah that idea of that dullness of, of, of their ears. And, and the, it's kind of like their closing of their uh, eyes, this hardness of their heart. Now, like I said, I think it's important we remember the context of our text, the immediate context, in my opinion, in, in Jesus using these parables is because he is purposely hiding information from those that have rejected him. Right now, here's the thing. It's not from everybody. He's not saying I'm talking in riddles so that nobody will understand anything that I'm saying. He tells the disciples, it has been granted to you to understand these things and to know these things. But to them, it's in riddles so that they could hear it, but not understand it. They, they see these things, but it doesn't make sense to them. I think that's a, a pretty interesting thing. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of what the Apostle Paul teaches us in Corinthians 
right? He talks about these things of Christ talking, and he's like, you need a spiritual mind to understand them. And he talks about what we would call Christians and non-Christians. When it comes to understanding the word of God and the things of God, uh, Paul says you need the spirit of God to know these things that are spiritually understood and discerned. And without it, it's just like, well, I don't get it. I mean, think about just immediate context of your own life, right? Not just this text, but of your own life. How many of you taught, how many times have you tried to share something spiritual, the word of God, something God is doing in your heart to an unbeliever, somebody that doesn't know Christ? Oftentimes they'll, they'll look at you like an old preacher back in Baton Rouge used to say, like a, a goat looking in a new fence, right? They kind of turn their hair like their head. I don't get it. I don't understand what the big deal is. I don't, I don't get it. And that's kind of what's happening here. I think that's an interesting uh, thing. Oftentimes we have this idea that Jesus is speaking in parables so that people can understand better when in actuality, it's, it's to kind of rather hide the meaning for, uh, for those who are, are lazy and dull. Now, of course, those with the Spirit of God, like us, that has been granted to know these things, we, we see great beauty in the parables. There's depths of, of understanding and riches on, on the, the kingdom of God. And it's one of those things that, yeah, sometimes you have to dig a little bit to get to those things, but they're there. And, and that's part of what Jesus has said. I think it's also important for us to understand Jesus making that distinction of those that it's been granted to understand and those that just out of the hardness of their heart, like those religious Pharisees, right? It's just the kind of set in, in their ways. They had an unwillingness to hear Jesus. They were, they were unwilling and, and dead set against not believing who he was or who he was claiming to be. And we see that Jesus says, this is part of the reason why he is teaching in, in parables. Because he did not want them to hear and believe. And also because God, I'm sorry, because they did not want to hear and believe. And also because in a way God was hiding the truth from them. Now, here's the thing. Even as I kind of wrote that out in my notes, this idea of God hiding the truth from them, that's basically what Jesus is saying. I know that right away, we don't like the way that sounds. We hear that and it's like, that just doesn't seem right, right? It doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's right. But let me remind you that it is truth. It is exactly what Jesus says. As I was thinking of this, I was reminded uh, uh, of this, and I want you to really think about this. How many of you know that oftentimes God and his sovereignty and his providence and his wisdom, oftentimes he will give us what we want. And that is not always a good thing, right? Think about our DBR, right? Our daily Bible reading that we've been doing. Hopefully you've been doing that with us as part of our Read 2020 program. Think of the things the, that we read in Judges, uh, Numbers, right? The, the children of Israel, this is what came to my mind in their wandering in the wilderness. What did they say? Oh no, Moses, you traitor, God's a traitor. You guys just took us out of Egypt and you brought us in this wilderness to die. When God and Moses both said, dude, we got great, God's got great things for you, great things for you. But what did they say? They had eyes, but they weren't seeing. They had ears, but they weren't hearing it. They didn't want any of it. No, no, no. God's unjust. He brought us here to kill us. He, he brought us here to be done with us, Right? And we're, we're, we're going to die. We're going to die. So much so that when Joshua and Caleb come and they're like, no, man, this is a, yeah, sure. It's going to be a fight. But man, these people are going to be breakfast for us. God's given us this land. What did the people say? No, 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 no. They would not hear. They would not see. They did not care to, to, to go in, if you would, to, to get the depths of the kingdom that, that God was giving them this land. They rejected it. And... What did God say? Okay, fine. If that's what you want, that's what you'll get. And sure enough, what happened? That whole generation died in the wilderness. Let's understand that God has given these people, especially these religious leaders that should know better, right? 
He has given them every chance to accept Jesus Christ, to accept that gospel message and the message of his kingdom. I mean, think about Jesus and his ministry that was a, uh, really who he was in his ministry was attested by these incredible miracles, things that are unheard of, things that you and I would, we would only hope that we would be able to see something like that in our day. How amazing would that be, right? These things were happening frequently in the ministry of Christ, yet they would not believe him. Therefore, the realities of that kingdom was taken away. It was not theirs to know, and it was given to those who did believe like the disciples, where they were able to understand and comprehend the great truths of the kingdom of God. Amen. Uh, let me share just one more thought with you. I thought this was uh, maybe a, a good way to say it. One Bible teacher uh, that I was um, reading behind, he was writing on this idea of parables and addressing exactly that. Um, people saying that Jesus taught parables so people could understand better. And, and he said this, uh, he says, I don't know if it's said so often these days, but there was a time when people constantly said to ministers, hey, preacher, you should tell more stories like Jesus so that we can actually understand. <laughs> I think that's funny. He goes on to say, but Jesus didn't tell these parables, right, these riddles, these stories, so much so that people would understand, right, but rather just the opposite is what we've seen. He says they were really test cases of whether they understood the gospel that he preached. And then he used as an example of the, the Bible teacher here in Luke 18 of the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. I think we all are familiar with that. Two men go to the temple, Jesus said. One's a Pharisee, one's a tax collector. Ooh, that's bad, right? Automatically. Remember, we got to take our understanding out of this, our, our culture and mindset. Let's go into their culture and mindset. The, let's say they're in, in our minds, right? Let's say it this way. There was a preacher, a Christian preacher, and a satanic worship evil person, right, that, that went into the temple of God. I know I'm being a little crazy in my, my language there, but that's the idea. The tax collectors were the worst of sinners, right, in the eyes of these people. And what does the Pharisee say? This this a pinnacle of righteousness in, in the eyes of the people. He says, God, God, I thank you that I'm not like that guy. I think I'm not a sinner like him. I, I thank you that I give, that I do, that I do, that I did this. And then the, fair, the tax collector, Jesus said, hey, he won't even lift his head. He just beats his chest, says, have mercy on me. And then Jesus says, which one of those men went home justified? Now, you and I, we know that answer. We interpret it through our culture, through our understanding of the Word of God as a whole, through, through the understanding of the, the Spirit of God in us and, and that work of the gospel and salvation. But you understand in that crowd, in that day, we were not thinking the same thing. They are not thinking the same thing that we are thinking. And he says this, the Bible teacher talking about that, he said, we need to understand nobody really listening to Jesus in that day thought that it would be the tax collector who went away from the temple justified. He says, Jesus tells these parables to probe inside us to see whether we really understand his gospel message and whether that gospel message is really beginning to transform our lives. I hope that gives us a better understanding of parables and maybe to wrestle with that. Maybe you thought that before, that Jesus taught him parables so that we could actually understand better. When really, it's quite the opposite. It was intentional. Uh, the hardness of hearts, fine. That's what you want. That's what you're going to get. And uh, with that being said, thank God it is granted to us to understand these things through the Spirit of God and that revelation so I'm grateful for that. Now, with that in mind, we're going to look at Jesus's explanation real quick at the parable, which I think all of us know it, but let's look at it. Let's see if we have ears to hear and eyes to see what Jesus says. Thankfully, in this, he, he gives us a clear understanding of, of what is meant in this parable. So let's take a look at this together in Matthew 13. We'll only look at this one text for right now. Matthew 13. 
Jesus says, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, uh, Mark and Luke will talk about uh, saying that the seed being sown is the word, which the immediate context, Jesus sees himself as the sower. He sees the seed being scattered as the word of God, or as it says here, the word of the kingdom. This message that Jesus is uh, spreading throughout all of Israel at that time and day and age, the message of who he is and, and that he's the Christ, the Messiah. And really what he's going to be describing in this parable are the different responses to Jesus, to this message, repent and believe. Everything John said, everything Jesus has been saying, we're going to see all this summed up in this parable. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes, right? Because of this, it's not just they don't understand it, but this goes back to that hardness of that path, right? The evil one represented by these birds comes, snatches it, what has been, uh, snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what is sown along the path, right? This, in my mind, goes right to those religious Pharisees. The hardness of heart, the seed is, it goes there and it just, it does not penetrate. It doesn't go anywhere. And the devil comes and snatches it away. He goes on to say this, as for what was sown on rocky ground. Now, I don't want us to imagine just big boulders, but the idea is that bedrock underneath is real rocky. So it, I'm sorry, you maybe couldn't see my hands, rocky. So it leaves short, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, shallow um, topsoil. And so when you're looking at it, it might look like good soil because you don't see the, the rocks underneath, but it's a, it's a rocky ground. There's no, no depth for those roots, no moisture there. And so what we see is for the one sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately they receive it with joy, right? Somebody maybe saw a miracle of Jesus and people are saying, hey, he's the Christ. They're like, woo, yeah, awesome. Okay, Jesus, cool. Let's do this. Yet... He has no root in himself and endures for a while, but some kind of tribulation. Hey, man, I thought following Jesus was going to be like this. And what did they do? They left. Right? John 6, a big portion of people left when Jesus was like, well, you know what? You're going to have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And they're like, come again. Cuckoo, cuckoo. I don't think so. And they turn their backs and they walk away. Tribulation, persecution, maybe something happening in their family. Oh, you're not really going to be one of those Jesus people, are you? And what happens? On account of the word that they received on who Jesus is, this comes and immediately they fall away. There's no depth. It's shallow. And then for those sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches come and it, it chokes that word and it proves unfruitful. As I think of this in the immediate context, I wonder if Jesus had somebody like Judas Iscariot on their minds, on, on his mind, the cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches choking that seed, that causing it to be unfruitful. And then he says this, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. That's the parable of the sower and seeds, probably better termed the parable of the soils. Like I said, what I'm trying to say is I think the immediate context of what that parable is and what Jesus is teaching is people responding, especially in that day and age, to his message. We can see the Pharisees. We can see the, the flighties. You can see the, the Judas Iscariots in it. You, you can see all these things. But there's also good soil, like his, his disciples that are, are going to receive that word. It's going to be in their heart. And man, they're going to go on to do great things for the kingdom of God. With that being said, I do not believe that it is wrong for us in our day, here we are in May 2020, to look at this and think of that seed as the word of God, as, as God's word, right? And, and think of it in terms of, of the soil of our hearts. And so that's how I'd like us to close our time right now is, if you would, just with a, a moment of reflection, how is our heart receiving God's word? Have we allowed our hearts to become hard and callous, right? 
maybe not so much through unbelief and just an outright rejection of Christ. No, no, no. We were Christians. We, we believe in Jesus. We believe in Christ. We're not rejecting that per se, but because we're dull of hearing and understanding, because we are lazy, because we don't really care to make an effort to read God's word. I don't have time for it, Scott. I just I just don't have time. I don't understand. It takes so long and it's it's hard and there's so much to read and I, the, the, the excuses could just go on for days and days. But the reality is when the word of God comes like tonight on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning, the preacher is preaching. Is that word finding good soil in your heart or is it just thudding on that path and the devil's coming and take it or taking it away to where there is no fruit in your life because of your own spiritual laziness of not making the effort to see and know and understand. Right? Then there's that rocky soil, right? I mean, you look at us and we're excited about Jesus for a little bit, man. I hear a word and I hear a message and I'm excited and man, praise God, this is awesome and amazing. But then trouble comes, tribulation comes. Maybe things get rocky in my marriage. Maybe something happens in my health. Maybe something happens with my kid. Maybe something in my job. And, and what do I do? I, I, I lose it, right? I, there, there is no depth of the word of God. I, let's be honest, we see that all the time, right? Somebody may come to faith in Christ and they seem to be excited. They seem to be hungry for the word of God, but something happens, right? I've even seen it in, in quote unquote mature Christians, people that call themselves Christian. Yeah, they might be excited about Jesus and his word for a little bit, but there's they're shallow. There's no depth there. Something happens that they don't like, and they're like, well, I didn't know that this is what Jesus, following Jesus, was going to be like. So what do they do? They turn their back, right? They, they wither away. They, they become unfruitful and just fade away, and slowly you don't ever see them in church again. Oh, sure, they might claim to be Christian, but I think really what they're saying is, well, I'm, I mean, I'm not Catholic, or I'm, I'm not... Uh, Muslim or I'm not atheist, so I got to be Christian. But I hope you understand being Christian is so much more than that. Is that a reflection of our hearts today? Right? I hear a message and maybe I got some joy and, and I'm excited about the word of God, but then something happens in my life and I just, I, I, I avoid it. Right? I'm not happy with what God is allowing in my marriage right now, so I close the book. I'm not happy with where my life is right now. I'm not happy with the persecution, the tribulation or whatever. And instead of opening in and, and digging my roots deeper, I'm shallow and I close the book and I, I, I walk away. I hope that's not our hearts. Pretty sure if we're honest with one another, we've experienced that maybe a little bit ourselves or even seen it in others. Another one is... Uh, the one with the thorns, the soil with the thorns. This is a good one, right? I mean, the, there's some depth there, but as they grow, it says that these thorns, the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth, choke it to where the word of God becomes unfruitful. I can't help but wonder how many Christians fall in that place where the, there's some depth there. There's some, some, they're not necessarily shallow and just giving up like that. But the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches have just choked the word of God from being productive in their lives. Is that you? Is that where your heart is? Right, the, the, you're not even able to, to just respond because you are so care, carried up and, and caught up with the affairs of this life, more in love with money and the pursuit of money than I am with God or the pursuit of God. And it's easy to tell. The things we love, we invest a lot of time in them. We invest a lot of time in it. How much time are we investing in our relationship with Christ? 
and in his word. Lastly, I'm going to close on a good note. There's that good soil producing 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. I don't know about you, but I want the Spirit of God to do such a work in my heart that my heart is prepped for the Word of God. That when it comes as I'm reading through it and studying it, as, as I preach it or as I'm hearing it preached to me or, or whatever it is, I want my heart to be good soil for the Word of God. And I trust that you do as well. Some of the things that we can do to help cultivate that, that heart is prayer. I always talk about it, but prayer is has such a way of softening our heart to the Word of God. It's that discipline of being consistent to, to listen to it, to think on it, to read it, to pray on it. I'm not saying you guys have to read 25 chapters a day. I'm saying, hey, why not take every day, take two or three verses, just kind of think through that. Let it work in your heart and your mind. Look at how you can apply those things. That's how we keep our hearts pliable and soft and, and, and ready for the Word of God. We get in trouble whenever we start neglecting the Word of God and we start caring more about this life than we do about heaven and the things of God when we allow the deceitfulness of riches to dis begin to choke out and, and we become unfruitful Christians. That's not what we want. We're going to believe God to help us have the, the, that good heart and cultivate that. As a matter of fact, we're going to close our time together with a word of prayer. Would you allow me to pray for you and, and myself? Because I have to guard my own heart. Um, I was texting a, a friend earlier this, uh, this week. Just it, it seems like I'm in a, a season of distraction it, it just seems like, uh, sometimes it just seems like, really, I know it's not, but it seems like all of hell just wants to keep me from the Word of God and from prayer. If something can happen, it can happen. And I have to be the first to confess that I haven't been faithful in, in, in prayer and in reading God's Word like I should, or even like I want to, right? I, you and I, we can't afford to just be hit or miss and do good for a season and then drop off and then pick it back up. I think the Lord is wanting that maturity, that consistency, and it's something that we have to work on. We've got to hold each other accountable to these things. It's, it's easy to neglect, but we're not going to do that. We're, we're going to press on. We're going to pursue and, and we're going to be faithful to pray that God would soften our hearts, that it would be just the right soil to receive the word of God. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this time in this Zion Night series. I thank you for those that have made the effort to watch and, and listen and participate, even though we're not in person. I'm so grateful for them taking the time. I pray that these studies have been fruitful, if anything, thoughtful and, and encouraging. Uh, Lord, uh, if, even if that's not the case, well, at least we got to spend some time reading your word. Uh, Lord, I know that the power isn't me. The power is in your word. And so I'm just trusting in that as we think about these parables, Jesus, and specifically this one of the soils. I know even in my own heart, Lord, I'm convicted. And, and I just want to say, Father, please uh, forgive me for how easily distracted I am at times. And so, Lord, I, I bring that before you and I'm asking that your Holy Spirit would work in my heart and in the heart and life of my brother and sister that is tuning in right now, that God, we would have hearts that reflect that good soil in your parable, producing that fruit 30, 60, 100 fold, that we would have ears to hear and, and eyes to see and minds to understand and comprehend. That, Lord, we wouldn't be those people that are dull in our understanding, but rather people that are faithful and hungry for the Word of God in our lives because we recognize its power and we don't want to live without your Word washing our minds and correcting our thinking and directing our lives. So, God, I pray that you would cause us to hunger and thirst for your word and for your presence and for your righteousness. 
Lord, help us to keep each other accountable and and pursuing your word and and making that effort, Lord, not to see it as a duty, but to, to see it as the privilege and the honor that it is. God, we thank you for sharing your word with us. We thank you as you told those disciples that, Lord, you have given us your spirit so that we can know you and understand your word. So, Jesus, we humbly submit ourselves to you and your word, asking that it would do its work in our lives. I pray that for myself and those that are watching uh, tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. All right, my friends. Well, that's it for our spring semester of Zionites. Once again, thank you for taking the time to tune in with me. I look forward to seeing you guys soon at church. Not only that, I look forward to seeing you in the fall, hopefully, for our fall semester of our Zionites Bible study. God bless, and we'll see you. Have a great week.